Okay. Then, um, so this workshop here today is uh, meant as an introduction to discrete global grid systems to those who A, haven't heard about it, or B, who have heard about it and want to learn a little bit more about it. Um, and for that, I have, uh, um, have the pleasure that uh, a few experts from the fields also joined today. Um, the, the schedule for today, the plan is about that we do the first hour roughly with a few introductory presentations from um, to, to just give some different perspective on discrete global grid systems. Then for all the people who are really interested in getting hands dirty, we do um, a couple of training sessions working with some different tools. These are prepared in, in a binder GitHub repository. I will put the link into the chat. And then after that, as everybody has, a, you know, has a bit of feeling, what are global grid systems? How does it relate to spatial data analysis and how does it work relate to working with spatial data in general? Um, we have a couple of experts coming in to, um, to have like a little panel discussion. So and the idea is that of course, you as participants uh, and also as experts can ask questions and then we answer them. And as well, I, I as the moderator, I've already prepared a couple of, of questions that um, I'll sort of uh, give them as food for thought. And so we can learn some of their perspectives on DDGS and the future of DDGS. Okay, then, um, in the uh, in stop sharing. Then I'll put this link here uh, at first, just if, if people get lost in between. And this would be the link. Oh no, sorry, that it's uh, everyone in the meeting. Sorry, here's the link of the materials. And and this is a couple of notebooks. Uh, prepared with a environment and for this to this we will come in an hour roundabout okay so for now i would like to start um our workshop here with um with a couple of presentations and uh, i sort of the main culprit here right now will start with the first presentation to give you an overview of um what I learned about discrete global grid systems during the last year. Okay, then I again, I'll start sharing. Okay, is it coming through? Not yet. Again, this but then I do uh, share screen again, just do the whole screen. This is because Zoom. That you're sharing, which which is, um, may I ask which which screen are you seeing now? Is it the one with the presentation? The, the title one. The title one. Yeah, cool. Okay, discrete global grid systems. Um, the main message here for today is that discrete global grid systems are sort of an alternative spatial data format. Uh, and and uh, indexing method. So they're sort of halfway between raster and vector, but they also have a couple of other interesting properties. So um, this presentation is hopefully only around 20 minutes, 25 maybe, and we'll cover a little bit of introduction. Then I'll show some uh, open source uh, software implementations. And uh, we finish with a comparison of area versus shape or distance preservation properties, because the whole thing here is still totally about geospatial and GIS. So we have to really talk about uh, you know, geographic uh, location and uh, projections and all these things. 
So a discrete global grid system is a spatial reference system that uh, uses a hierarchical tessellation of cells to partition and address the globe. Yeah, and so there's a couple of important things in, in this. Um, it's a spatial reference system, so you can um, refer to locations uh, around the globe. It is uh, using a hierarchical tessellation. That means um, Earth is subdivided into cells, and these cells completely cover the Earth. Um, and the higher and lower resolution cells have some sort of parent-child relationship. And you can use it to address any place on the globe. So this is from the Open Geospatial Consortium abstract specification. And um, in order to build a DGGS, yeah. So here we go really a bit about <laughs> back into the into the theory. So um, DGGS as a concept is is not so new anymore. There's already a few decades of research behind. It's just in the recent years, the compute maybe a recent decade. The, the computation uh, computational power and availability really made it possible to um, to to really use those. So and um, from the theoretical background, in order to implement a discrete global grid systems, you have to have a couple of steps. So and this is here from Kevin Saar, who is also one of the sort of uh, strong people in the field. So at first you have to have a base shape or a base solid, and that sort of determines how um, on which uh, your your grid, your tessellation will be will be um, put. Then secondly, this base shape has to be oriented somehow somehow around the Earth in order to you know cover cover the sphere you know or our geoid. Then we have to come up with a hierarchical spatial partitioning method that defines on the faces on these um, base shapes and then a method for transforming the planar partition of each of those faces from the base shape to the corresponding spherical or ellipsoidal surface of our, our earth and then a method of uniquely indexing these cells so different base shapes um, and actually, I think uh, intuitively you most know of them, uh, which is uh, like a pyramid, a cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. And um, you will probably have seen the icosahedron lately a lot. But of course, we know a cube is a very powerful uh, way of uh, indexing spatial data as well. So in this base solid, so the idea is you have these different base solids or base shapes, and they somehow have to be oriented around the earth somehow in order to you know um, set the, the the base faces to locate them somewhere fixed and uh, then these base faces they are then tessellated and in order to um, be projected so now we can see um, what it would mean if you would have different of these base shapes in our in, 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 a, in an almost sphere so cubes have a quite big face that will cause a lot of distortions in the end, because if we know um, the, the larger the area we make flat from Earth in terms of projection, the more distortion we get always. And um, But cubes have some really uh, sort of good properties in terms of spatial data. Basically all our spatial indexing methods are currently based around quad trees, more or less, that, that are based on squares and subdivisions of squares. However, the smallest faces has the icosahedron, which is sort of the closest, the closest to a sphere with the, the, the smallest um, separate planes that have to be projected. So um, it also has some other interesting properties. And it's again based on these base faces from these base solids. Here's a square, here's a triangles, here's a pentagon, and uh, those have to be subdivided somehow usefully in order to get our tessellation. So that's why this is also important to consider. And then as mentioned, the orientation, you can you know, change the, 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 the a cube, for example, but you can also turn or, 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 or um, tilt the icosahedron or the other base shapes uh, in order to have the corners you know, the corners of these faces, because they are also sort of special places, in order the corners 
of these um, in different areas of the world. Because if you turn them, and, and this will cause some of the, let's say, problems that will come out later, to be um, uh, sort of avoiding certain areas. For example, if you want to have all those corners, you can turn it this way, that they are in the ocean. If, if, if those corner areas have problems for the scope of work you want to use the DGS for, then you would sort of orient it this way that it's in the, in the ocean. So, so those type of things are to be considered. And then we have the partition method. So and it's important to consider um, why, why we again have the different partition methods. So there's squares or other sort of um, quadly, quadly uh, laterals, so still four corners, squares or rhombus, diamonds, triangles or hexagons. So one of the things we want to consider is congruence. And that means, can we subdivide a cell into child cells? Because we want to have this hierarchical tessellation, right? In order to have nice parent-child relationships. So of course, a square, we can use um, four squares are always nice children for a for a main square. There's another way you can also have nine squares as a um, as the child uh, of one parent cell. Uh, so in hexagons, it's really hard to have um, the coverage nice. And in um, triangles, you would have um, always four triangles that can make up a parent triangle. The next thing is a is a percher. So the percher says how many of those child cells will fill a parent cell. And this is sort of also related to the congruence. As I said, a percher for, for a square, if you take a square and subdivide it into four children, um, four child squares, then you have a percher for. That means a percher. If you would take um, the nine children cells to subdivide each square, then you would have a percher nine. So for triangles, you mostly have a percher four. And for hexagons, there's a couple of weird constellations that I can show you later. Then another thing we want to consider when doing partitioning is adjacency. So in, in many spatial uh, concepts, we need to relate to neighbors. And uh, for example, in flow um, in hydrology, there's always the problem with either eight directions or, or four directions, that you, the flow only can go along the full edges or can the flow also be modeled over the corners. So the problem here is now that um, only the neighbors directly on the sides, on the full edges, have um, the same distance from the centers to each other, right? Whereas the D8, the corner ones, the, the queen's ones, neighbors, they are actually the distance always a bit further away. So for hexagons, this adjacency is, is really nice because all hexagons are oriented always this way, that all neighbors are always having almost the, the same distance. Well, technically, it's a perfect alignment for neighbors. Oopsie. And uh, for triangles, it's really, really complicated. You have uh, Direct neighbors can be close, can be a little bit further away, or can be really far away. So neighbors in, in triangles is, is really bad. And lastly, we have a thing called compactness that says the area to perimeter ratio. It's just how compact. So a sphere is obviously the most compact. It's the smallest perimeter covering and closing the largest area. So and, and hexagons also have really high compactness. So that makes them really nicely covering really equally area. So and for, for squares and triangles, it's not so ideal. So if you look at um, a percha and at these properties from a, a few different angles, so here you see um, a percha for, uh, for example, here on the left side, that would be Google S2, for example. You see always, always four, make up the next parent. And um, quads are always really nice for, for indexing. Um, but then they don't have so good um, adjacency. Here's also some, some weird um, combinations, which is geometrically correct because it's on the sphere, it's projected, but it's still sort of for us in terms of uh, neighborhoods, is that, that's a bit strange. 
And of course, currently most remote sensing stuff is going on in, in pixels and in square-based pixels. So then um, here for hexagons, if you talk about a percha and um, the congruency, so here on the left side, you see a perch seven, which is also used by Uber um, H3. And um, you may see always seven children make up a parent, then, you know, next parent and seven. So the, the problem though is you never get a full match, right? Because it's sort of awkward. You're always cutting a little bit through. And then you have these uh, mixed um, perches <clears throat> with hexagons. That, that work mathematically really well um, with, with uh, but again, you have these awkward parent-child relationships where, um, where you have sort of never, only, only like a central one is full in, and then around there, there's a lots of belonging to two other parents. So that's always a bit complicated. Also, hexagons cannot be fully used to, excuse me, <coughs> to subdivide the earth. Um, so there will always be a few pentagons, like you see here is one pentagon. And this is in this boundary, in these corner areas. So you see um, there's always 12 pentagons or, or five, uh, sixth of, of an area, one sixth of an area. Ah, yeah. and, and the pentagons are, of course, only five, sixth of, of the area, so they're not the full area. So this pentagon has not the same size like all the other pentagons, uh, hexagons, because because it's a pentagon, it's like, a, you know, a six smaller. So it's just uh, something on the side to know. Then as we said, triangles, triangles actually quite often used in, in so-called TINs, you know, um, triangular irregular networks, which is great for, for surface tessellation, which you often see. Um, and they can basically, you know, tessellate, subdivide all other uh, base solids. You know, you can subdivide squares with triangles, or other triangles, or hexagons. So they are quite versatile from that. Um, but uh, they have really low compactness, and um, they have this really bad neighborhood behavior. And you have this non-uniform orientation of cells. If you would, you know, have the whole Earth. Um, covered in triangles. So that makes triangles sort of a bit of a, of a weird outlier here. And then you have something um, very interesting, which is coming from New Zealand um, in, in, in one DGGS system. It uses a multi shape partitioning. So you can see here it uses a percha nine squares, but then it has some um, rhombus um, um, diamond shapes. And then it uses even some uh, triangles. And on the top and the bottom, you will have a circle. So um, you have lots of flexibility. You get some really other good, other interesting properties from that DGGS system. But of course, algorithmically, it's really complicated because you would have to, you would have to have your algorithm be able to deal with suddenly change of shape and different neighbor neighborhood behavior. Yeah, so there's no real trade, uh, no real silver bullet. And all these, um, these shapes here now, they have to be projected. Each of those then goes based on the base solid. They get then projected. Yeah, so the cells that cover this area, then they get projected on this planar area. So, and for this projection, there's a, there's a couple of um, approaches. The most widely used uh, is either um, ICA, is Ecosahedral Snyder Equal Area, which is based on the Ecosahedral, and it aims uh, for equal area. And then um, Uber H3s, hexagons, they use actually the gnomonic um, projection, which aims at shape preservation. Then there's a, um, a compromise, fuller gray, that has been used in some. And uh, real peaks, as I just said, with this multi shape, they actually use their own projection, which is also air area preserving. So here's the unfolding. So and then lastly, um, we have indexing, and then based, of course, on the shapes and and the uh, base solid, <coughs> you would have different um, indexing 
mechanisms. And indexing is important for, for storage because if you think uh, of one of the beauty things is that you have those cells, those cells represent a location on Earth. And um, if they have an, a unique ID, you always know exactly the ID on Earth. Yeah, so you just need now an indexing mechanism that you can move back and forth. Yeah, so some of those are yeah, the access based indexing, like uh, I think this is even in, in um, or, or hierarchical indexing that, that we sort of know, you know, like uh, geohash, for example, goes bigger and bigger, or space filling curves. So everything again has its um, advantages and disadvantages, sort of a little bit. Um, and then, but but what's the main purpose for this all is to avoid distortion and singularities of classic Langlois based grids. So even some of those recent discoveries of um, Esri's new natural global grid or Equi7, there's lots of approaches to work with global data that does not have distortion in some areas, or at least not bad. You know, if you think of Mercator, then we really know that towards the poles, it gets really badly airily distorted. The direction is okay and the shape looks good, but um, the area gets completely blown up. So the problem is with people using Mercator is they get a wrong impression of the size of the countries. So the idea with uh, global grid systems is that you use data in, in, uh, in a system which is in, intrinsically ready for 3D Earth, uh, and and you optimize still for some properties. Yeah, so either you want, for example, equal sized cells for statistics often, um, or you want that, uh, you know, the neighbors are always the same distance and um, for, for sort of uh, traffic or direction uh, management. And the good thing is, as you have those IDs, you can do computing on global scale. You don't have to reproject data anymore. You always have data in the right coordinate reference system and you can store it even technically without spatial attributes because you only need the ID and and the values the data values so um, currently the situation is that there's no universal DGS and you still sort of have to decide which application um, there are some solutions um, for DGS there's some commercial software there's open source software um, but interoperability and, and conversion between different DGS is not straightforward. I think the situation is rather worse than or, or similar to just having from one normal projection to another projection of geospatial data. And um, yeah, there's for most for most software, particularly open source software, there's not not really a GUI uh, available to use, and so it has a high entry level into usage. And um, some of those are not so good for spatial analysis. Okay, here's, here's some open source implementation, Uber H3, Google S2, OpenEager, uh, RealPix, DGGGrid. And DGGrid has a Python wrapper and um, an R adaptation. The R, R adaptation is, uh, I think, more mature. Okay, then I want to just, just show a, a few um, examples. So Uber H3 uses a Percha 7 hexagonal tessellation and uses gnomonic projection. So they have uh, a desire to keep the shape rather preserved, not so much the area. And uh, the core library is written in C, I think actually in C, uh, but has lots of bindings and different languages. It's really popular and really well usable. And what I now show over the next couple of examples is at first I always show the aerial distortion so what we did is we took basically every single cell reprojected them in order to measure aerial distortion across the globe and on the right side you will have the histogram to see um, sort of uh, normalized deviation from from the standard area from the average area and you see that h3 has in some areas has um, uh, stronger aerial distortion, but they put those intentionally actually into areas of low population so that it is actually really important. And you see the range 0 0.6, 1.2 is um, quite a bit of aerial distortion. 
<clears throat> in terms of compactness though, that's what they were really aiming for is that the shape um, stays uh, really, um, really undistorted. And so whenever they look at, at, at distances from an area, that's what they used it for, for um, their dispatch management to see in one area is demand and another is, um, is uh, request. And then they, because of the distance. So that's what um, Uber H3 is, is optimized for. And then I always show uh, from the resolutions, if you would have sampled the data in a very high resolution, and then aggregating, you know, tessellation up, how it would then look like. So, and as you can see, H3 with the aperture of seven gets um, at some point quite quite coarse, uh, of course, and then some steps really and loses some detail. In Google S2, one of the use cases was in Pokemon, and this is square based, and this is written in C++, has a couple of bindings for Python, Java, but this has to be compiled and it is not like easily installable. And I think this actually doesn't work on Windows because there's some software comp compilation things that you can't use it. And uh, the main purpose is actually to have um, a library for operations on spherical geometry. So they don't even assume ellipsoid, they actually assume a sphere. So there's um, um, some trade-offs, but there's a very robust and flexible and high performance library. So obviously aerial distortions um, are similar bad <laughs> as in, in uh, H3, a little bit more maybe even. And uh, compactness is also not ideal, but it's also you see the compactness here is at 0 0.8 is uh, not, not so. But that's what Google said is that it's a trade-off and it's a really fast library for, for really large scale data. And as you see, because it's, it's, uh, it's uh, um, Aperture 4, it sort of slowly aggregates data and this sort of the aggregation um, zooming out basically. Then OpenEGA was developed by RiskAware. It's also on, on GitHub. It doesn't seem to have been developed further in the last two years. It's also based on C++. Um, it implements ICR3H, so um, equal area Aperture 3 hexagons or Perch of four triangles. Um, so the API, I've been told, is um, also a bit crude because not crude, but working with this type of um, hexagons can be at first uh, sort of a bit uh, strange for for a developer not knowing going down parents, parents and children. So, um, but equal area focus of of this is here um, the triangular one. You can see equal area is, is uh, quite good. Here you see the standard deviation. So this is really area preserving. And, um, but because triangles, the shape compactness you see is, is uh, really bad actually. But this is also not, this was really for, for um, insurance companies. It was just zonal statistics basically. And if you would take, then here you see triangles up the, up the chain makes it becomes really uh, strange a bit. Then real pick. So real pick is, uh, as I said, is mainly developed at Landcare Research New Zealand. Robert Gibb from also from OGC and from Landcare um, has been one of the main drivers in this. Yeah, Robert Gibb, and it has you know this this weird multi shape uh, Percha nine. It's a pure Python package. It's a little bit, I think, still sort of scientific rather, and. Um, uh, so some of some of the functions are a bit slow, and, and the API is not so well documented. <coughs> but here you can see, look at the area preservation. It is like also really really good. We just quickly go back to um, to here with um, zero point nine, and then zero dot, and this is uh, I think actually quite a similar scale really. So it's really, really area preserving. And, but you see towards the poles, you still have a slight distortion, slight that uh, towards the equators. It's like in other coordinate reference systems that uh, towards the equator, it's a bit more normal and towards the poles, it's a bit more um, larger. And uh, the shape 
compact is of course a bit strange um, because of the different type of cells they're using. That that's why this looks like this. In the aperture nine, you can see it can coarse really quickly, and you lose really quickly detail. So that's why a higher aperture is sometimes not so great, <coughs> or not necessarily what you want. Depends. And then the DG grid is a command line tool that. Um, uh, it's not so much a DGGS itself. It, you can construct many different DGGSs with it, and it's sort of to, to explore data and to explore those. Um, and basically, you can use uh, again ICR, ICR, or or fuller gray for projection, and you can have um, as a base shape equosahedron, but you can have it use it with hexagons, triangle, diamonds. It, you can sort of construct it. It's a bit. Um, so of elaborate to, to build it, but it's a very interesting tool. It's basically written in C++. Um, and it's sometimes, uh, you know, it has to be compiled. You have to compile yourself. So if you look for um, area, um, for uh, distortion, so barely any, because we're still in, in this, you see, there's, there's a few dots um, off, by the way, which comes from those hexagon, uh, pentagons. So and those pentagons, they they draw it a little bit off, but they're quite rare. And then the shape X again is a bit um, the compactness. Uh, this is must be part like sort of artifacts, sort of of the. Although I mean the the ratio is not bad actually. It's uh, still zero at nine, so it's actually quite good. And then um, because this is a purchase three, you have a really slow um, um, increase of the resolution yeah so that there was that sort of a background on 